How's everyone doing the challenge? Yeah? Yeah! Woo! Awesome. Um, if you're uh, struggling with stage three, I'm gonna drop a little hint here. 2480, I'll leave that to you. Uh, so, hi, my name is Matt Knight. I'm a software engineer with Bastille Networks, and today I'm gonna talk to you about the Lorify and a new out of tree module that I'm re releasing to implement it called GR Lora. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm on the threat research team uh, at Bastille with Ballant and Mark. And uh, my background, I have a BE in electrical engineering from Dartmouth, and I've done some uh, things in the government world prior to joining, uh, joining Bastille. So we've got a lot to cover, we're gonna move really quickly. Uh, we're gonna start by talking about LoRa and LP WANs, which are a new class of wireless network. Uh, then we're gonna talk about the LoRaFi in pretty good detail. Uh, and finally, we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna introduce my new out of tree module for LoRa called GR LoRa. So to get started, what, what's a LoRa, right? What is this thing? It's a wireless IoT protocol, and before we get into the details of exactly what that means, I just want to establish that when we talk about IoT, we're talking about embedded devices, right? And there are tons of standards out there for communicating, uh, for implementing embedded communication. Uh, many of these you will have heard of, and if you're doing the challenge, you'll probably be playing with some of these, uh, such as 802.15.4 and all of its friends like Zigbee, 802.11, Wi-Fi is pretty popular in the IoT world. And then you have Bluetooth and Bluetooth Low Energy, two really popular standards, and the list goes on, right? So we've got all these things. What's wrong with them? Why do we need more? Well, all these protocols that we talked about, to some extent, require some degree of local provisioning. Um, and many of them require gateways in order to implement networks. And finally, in the case of some, like 802.11, they're pretty power intensive, so if you're designing something that's gonna run on the battery, that's pretty challenging. Um, so what's ideal then? What about cellular? Uh, it works everywhere, you don't need any local, uh, local provisioning to get it to work on a site, uh, and it's easy to install. Um, unfortunately, it is power intensive, and in the case of the most popular cellular variant, it's going away. I'm talking about 2G, GPRS, and Edge service. Uh, AT&T is slated to sunset these networks at the end of this year, so January 1, 2017, they're turning those towers off. So that's like four months from now. Uh, one of the most popular 2G services is gonna get turned off. Um, and other major carriers are gonna follow there. So 2G's advantage is that it provides service everywhere. I mean, you can get 2G service pretty much all over the world. Uh, it's battery conscious and the radios are pretty cheap and the data as well. So this is exactly what these IoT embedded applications require. Uh, now when it comes to replacing 2G, if you're a developer, you can either move to 3G, a more modern cellular technology, uh, but that brings with it more expensive radios and some harder power requirements or you can hold out and wait for the uh, LTE standards answer to the deprecated 2G standard. And that's this LTEM uh, release 13 standard that's gonna be, the standard's already out, uh, but all indications that I've gotten from people in the industry is that uh, this is not gonna be ready by the sunset date. Uh, more likely it's gonna be deployed sometime in 2018. So what that means is there's this void in the market if you are trying to develop a, um, a broadly deployable IoT connected solution. So uh, a number of companies have popped up to address, address this gap and try to capitalize on it. Uh, and one of the most promising emerging technologies is called LoRa. Uh, LoRa is an LP WAN developed by Semtech, uh, which is a semiconductor company. Uh, and it's brand new. The Phi was patented uh, in uh, June of 2014, so just two years ago. And then the, uh, the layer two standard for developers was only released in January of last year. Uh, there's a robust, um, developers consortium called the LoRa Alliance that supports it. I think they said it tripled in size in the last year, so it's growing like you wouldn't believe, uh, but still very, very new. Uh, LoRa is an LP WAN, uh, which is a new class of network, uh, and the acronym stands for Low Power Wide Area Network. The best way to think of it is it's just like a cellular topology where you have a number of uh, base stations distributed geographically, and then end, end devices connect directly up to it like a distributed star network. Um, but what really sets it apart is these networks have incredible range at very low power, um, at very low power um, requirements. We'll get more into the details later. So there are a couple standards that have a lot of traction. Um, the two biggest ones are LoRa and Sigfox. Uh, Sigfox has raised $115 million within the last 18 months or so. Uh, so they're, they're, they're going for it. Um, and then two of the biggest LoRa adopters have raised uh, just over $50 million as well. So there's a ton of investment in the space. It's, it's really a pretty hot place to be right now. Um, so it's, it's there's some traction here. So when we talk about LP WANs, we're talking about wireless networks optimized for IoT applications. This means they're battery conscious. 
Um, Sigfox advertises 10 years on a single AA battery, which is insane. Uh, they have, and they have very uh, good range as well. And if you compare this with the existing standards, these both compare pretty favorably. So how do, they, how do they get this performance? They embrace the fact that embedded devices are built on compromises. So they build limitations into the protocol to enable these devices to, to sp uh, work at very low power for over very long ranges for a long time. Uh, so there's aggressive uh, duty cycling on these messages, so you can't, you can't uh, send messages continuously, you can only send a couple. Uh, uh, the datagrams are very sparse, meaning very small, and they're rate limited. Uh, so some examples of this is Sigfox limits uh, devices to 140 12-byte datagrams per day. So that's, that's pretty tiny. Uh, another LP WAN standard called Weightless N is uplink only, meaning your end devices can only send messages up to the base station. They can't receive a downlink message back down. And finally, LoRa Class A devices, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, can only receive downlink uh, during a preset window after sending an uplink message. So if you're the network operator and you want to send a device down to, to an endpoint, you have to wait for it to talk to you before you can talk down to it. And that's so the device can stay asleep for a long time and not spend battery being awake with its radio on listening for a message. One other really interesting note about, about these LP WAN standards is that most of them are designed to operate in the ISM bands. Uh, LoRa uses the 900 megahertz ISM band. Um, and what's awesome about this is you don't need a license to, uh, to, to play in this space. If you compare this with cellular, uh, a presenter earlier today talked about the FCC spectrum, uh, spectrum auctions. This is a uh, page from a price list that I got my hands on of the uh, FCC reverse white space auction. And if you want to buy the air rights to WCBS uh, in New York, you can get out your checkbook and write a $900 million check and, and buy that. And then, you know, if maybe you can start to compete with Verizon and AT&T if you want. Um, alternatively, you can uh, start to play with these standards, which require no licensure at all. So what's really cool about this is one day deploying a network that can cover miles and miles of range might be as easy as going to Best Buy and buying a Wi-Fi router. It's the same type of regulations that applies to Wi-Fi and then the 900 megahertz ISM uh, bands as well. So it's very different, um, very different topology, and it's going to be interesting to watch it, uh, watch it develop. So this wraps up the background. Let's get into the details with LoRa and what makes it cool. LoRa is built on a proprietary uh, modulation uh, that's a type of chirp spread spectrum. Uh, a chirp, uh, you learned a little bit about when Bond spoke on, on uh, Tuesday. A chirp is a signal of continuously increasing or decreasing frequency, kind of like a sweep tone. Uh, here's a spectrogram of an up chirp and a down chirp. Uh, an up chirp uh, is continuously increasing frequency, a down chirp is continuously decreasing frequency. And in this case, we have a channelized to a certain band, so when the signal, when the frequency reaches the end of the band, it's going to wrap down to the bottom and keep going. Uh, CSS is pretty cool because it has very good low power performance. It's extremely resilient to interference and uh, uh, also multipath and Doppler, which are things that are relevant if you're designing for, uh, for urban applications and anything that might, might be mobile. Uh, so interesting set of benefits here. Um, where else do we see chirps used? Radar is a really common application. Uh, various military and marine radars implement uh, chirps as, uh, as part of their, their modulation. And there are some other open source projects that use chirps that are pretty cool as well, like the um, GNU Chirp Sounder, which is used for visualizing ionospheric radars for, that measure space weather and geomagnetic activity. Uh, so the LoRa standard, the PHI is proprietary. The standard has not been published. Um, the layer two and up standard is published as uh, LoRa WAN. You can go and look that up. But the PHI itself is, is, is proprietary. You, can't get, you, you cannot go and get documentation that tells you how it works. Um, Still, Laura looks pretty cool. I thought after hearing all this, I was pretty intrigued. I want to get my hands on it. Um, what is one to do without, without X to the standard? Let's take it apart and see how it works. So I did that earlier this year. I published my findings at DEF CON 24 and at the Jailbreak Security Summit. Uh, my slides from, from that are published online. Um, my GitHub uh, link, link is right there. And I am also um, have a paper in uh, the technical proceedings from this conference and uh, a very deep dive will be published in the upcoming uh, POC or GTFO uh, issue. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that journal, if that's too under the radar. But um, that's coming out in the next month. So you can check that out if you want the details on the, uh, the uh, blind signal analysis and decoding process here. So 
to, to do that, reverse, to do that, that, that analysis, um, I used a B210 as the receiver and then an off-the-shelf LoRa board uh, that was capable of uh, somewhat arbitrarily injecting packets. It had a USB interface that you could pull up and basically send a string to it and it would modulate it, send it out over the air, and then I could pull it down with my SDR to, uh, to, to iterate on the waveform. Uh, so you put those two things together and you get this. This is what a uh, LoRa transmission looks like. Uh, let's take a closer look at what we have here. Um, so in the first stage, you can see that we have a series of repeated up chirps. And this looks like it could be a preamble or some sort of training sequence. Just beneath it, we have uh, two and a quarter uh, down chirps, which you know, look analogous to a synchronization word or a start of frame delimiter. And then finally, we have all these choppy up chirps of varying length. And this looks like the data, right? You know, these are common things that are ubiquitous across pretty much every digital, modern digital radio system. We can start to draw analogies between what we're seeing here and other things that we may have seen before. So looking at the phi data unit even further, we can observe that the chirp rate is static. That is, the rate at which the chirp frequency is changing is constant, uh, or the first derivative of the frequency. Uh, however, uh, the chirp will jump throughout the band instantaneously. Um, so that is, is the essence of the modulation, is that what we're looking at here are frequency modulated chirps. And the data is, in, is modulated on, onto the chirp by changing its position within the band instantaneously. Uh, we'll get into a little more detail. Um, so we pointed out these, different, these three different elements, right? We have our preamble, our start of frame delimiter, and our data, data segment. Um, so we're going to start working through them and writing some software that can, that can detect these different elements. So step one with, with de developing a, uh, a receiver here is we need to identify the beginning of the frame. Uh, once we have that, we're going to synchronize the start of the, uh, the, the data section by using those start of frame uh, delimiter down chirp bytes, or down chirp symbols. And then finally, we're going to extract data from the uh, continue, or we're going to uh, extract data from the uh, frequency transitions in the, in the payload section. So how are we going to do this? First, we need to find a way to quantify those frequency transitions. And one of the interesting techniques that we came up with that was really useful is to transform the signal by dechirping it. So what we can do is we can generate a local up chirp and a down chirp at the appropriate rate. And if we multiply them, bo them both against the signal, something inter interesting happens. Uh, so this is the initial result from our GNU Radio, um, GNU Radio prototype here. And you can see that, uh, that those choppy, choppy signals and all of a sudden are turned into these nice linear features aligned with, aligned with um, the uh, uh, nice linear features in time that we can start to, uh, start to do stuff with, right? Uh, so first, some definitions that will be useful as we, uh, as we start to get, get more into this. Um, the bandwidth refers to the width of the uh, spectrum that the signal occupies, like the mac basically the maximum amount of frequency that the chirp can traverse. The spreading factor is the number of bits encoded per symbol. Uh, and finally, the chirp rate uh, is the first derivative of the chirp frequency, right? And, and we, through observation, we determined that that, was, uh, that that was was static. And the only instance where it changes is when we're talking about the down chirp, which is just the negative chirp rate of the up chirp. Uh, so going through some documentation that was available, I was able to pull out some common numbers for this. Uh, so we have numbers for the, the bandwidth and the spreading factor, and the ch uh, chirp rate is a function of the first two. So a symbol in this case is uh, is one of those frequency changes within, the, uh, within the, the, uh, the band of the chirp, right? And we have, from the prior slide, this notion of the spreading factor, which is the number of bits packed into each symbol. So from that, we can infer that the maximum number of symbols that is possible is, is two to the spreading factor. Uh, so to extract the symbols, we came up with this process here. You can channelize the, uh, channelize the signal to the bandwidth of the chirp to isolate the signal to just, just the data that you're interested in. Uh, Dechirp it using that process that we mentioned before with the locally generated chirps. Then finally, we can take an FFT of the dechirp signal where the, the number of bins in the FFT is equal to the number of possible symbols. Once we have that, then the most powerful component in each FFT will be the symbol at that, at that instance in time. So, you know, we write the code and do this out, and there we go. Right here, we have aligned in time the original signal on the left, and then finally the dechirped up chirp and dechirped down chirp uh, signals in the middle and right, respectively. So here you can see on the left we've got the preamble, and then finally on the right we have. Initially we have the preamble, which turns the, that nice linear feature we can use to identify. 
and we have the SFD that we can synchronize against followed by the data. Uh, so kind of just talk through this, we'll go through this quickly. Uh, step one with identifying the start of the packet is to find the preamble, which from observation here we can tell is identified by the same symbol repeated for some number of symbols. Uh, then we need to identify the uh, beginning of the phi data unit, which we can do by looking at the start of frame delimiter. Uh, so we look at the, uh, the de-chirped, down -chirp signal, look for some number of continuous uh, symbols, uh, and then once we have that, we know the length of the SFD, so we jump forward that many samples, and then we're at the start of the uh, start of the phi data unit. And we can do the FFT process again to get the symbols out. Important note, uh, accurately finding the SFD is essential for establishing accurate sync here. Uh, if you don't have a good sync, what can happen is the, si the energy from each symbol can be split between, multiple con between two consecutive FFTs. And if that happens, you can get collisions. So here's an example. If you look at lines 39 and 50, you can see how the, the energy from those two symbols is split between adjacent, adjacent FFTs, and therefore it's almost impossible to tell you know, which, which symbol is, is present at, at which instance in time, right? So the uh, solution to that is to find a way to get a more accurate sync. So the way that we do that is by increasing the time-based FFT resolution by overlapping, uh, your, by overlapping consecutive FFTs. So the way to think about this is rather than processing each sample exactly once in an FFT buffer, you shift the samples through the buffer as time goes on. Um, and that enables you to get much better time-based resolution on these FFT features. I'll zoom in here and you can see how you get much better granularity on e each of the uh, um, each of the, uh, the symbols here. Um, we have a nice side-by-side -side right here that shows you exactly how using this uh, overlapped, um, overlap methods to find the sync can clean up the, uh, the results. If you look at line 39, you see the non-overlapped solution on the left, and finally the non-overlapped result after establishing an accurate sync on the right, and you can see how that collision just goes away. So, uh, kind of handy. Um, and here's the, uh, the, the long form result where you have the collisions on the left of the whole packet and then finally the, the accurately, more accurately resolved version on the right. Okay, so that's stage two, finding the start of the, the, um, finding the, start of the packet. Uh, the final uh, step is to uh, basically rotate all of the symbols so that they're aligned with the, uh, the preamble. Um, and the reason behind that is because uh, the chirp that we're generating locally to de chirp the signal is very likely going to be out of phase with the chirp that's being used to modulate the data on the transmitter side. So basically what that means is our symbols are going to be offset by some, by some constant value. So we can do that by doing a modulo operation uh, to, to reduce the, um, or by, by subtracting the, uh, the preamble's index, uh, symbol index, and then doing a modulus operation at the length of the FFT to normalize everything about zero. And then we have the symbols. So that's the DMOD in a nutshell. Um, now, once we have this, of course, we have to start looking at encoding. Uh, and uh, remember, again, that LoRa is closed source here. So some material was available through data sheets. Um, there was a, a patent application, a European patent application, uh, some prior art, uh, and also some data sheets. Uh, so uh, there are a couple clues that we were able to glean from this, namely that the, the symbols were indexed, um, or the symbols were gray coded to prevent off by one uh, symbol errors from polluting the uh, uh, from polluting the data. Um, there's data whitening, which induces randomness uh, for, uh, for, for clock recovery. Um, there's interleaving, which scrambles all the bits within the frame, which paired up with forward error correction uh, makes it more effective, and that adds a number of error correcting bits. Uh, so we have uh, these four distinct operations to take a look at to, to, to figure it out, right? And again, I'll mention that there was some open source information that, that hinted at the fact that this is, this is likely what was present. Easy enough, right? No way. Uh, why is that? Because all this documentation that we found was filled with lies. Um, so we have all these red herrings that we, we got from these, these legitimate sources, right? We have a patent application which describes in detail the, index, the gray indexing portion and the, inter, the interleaver. They actually give an algorithm for the interleaver used. Um, however, experimentally, uh, I was able to work through this and find out that, in fact, all of these really good sources were total lies, except for the forward error correction, which is actually cool. So, um, so the, the solution to crack the decoder, um, I've published this before. I'm kind of going to hand wave at this, but all the information's out there if you want to look at this. Because um, this, this 
would take a while to go through, it's pretty hairy. Um, but the gist of it is that by, by making assumptions and looking, but by basically by looking at the information that we had and then making the right assumptions, we're able to divide the problem out uh, to, so that we could basically address elements one and two, the symbol, uh, the gray indexing and data whitening, and then three and four is two separate elements. So you can basically split this problem in half and then iter iteratively solve through it. So once we started putting some intelligence behind it and starting to, um, to uh, iterate through this, uh, we were basically only left with one experimental variable, uh, which combined with some good, ex good assumptions we were able to solve for. Uh, so again, I'll mention this was hard. This was the hardest part of doing all of this. Um, I'm hand-waving at it now, but it's all out there in some of my prior research if you check it out if you're interested. Uh, GitHub link is there, and again, I'll plug the uh, POC or GTFO and the GRCon preceding um, articles that are, are coming out imminently. All right. Um, brings us to what, what you're all probably most interested in. Uh, GR LoRa. Um, this is an out-of-tree implementation of the Phi that uh, is being released this afternoon. Uh, pretty excited about it. And our motivation for developing this is that currently, since LoRa is closed source, all of the existing interfaces that we have to it are at layer two and above. We have the interfaces that are provided um, through, through, the IC, through LoRa ICs. So if you want to develop a product on, on a LoRa chip, you have some interface and API that's provided to you by, by Semtech. And then you have the LoRa Mac and WAN standards, which define layer two and up, right? Um, however, it's very important that we not take file layer security for granted, right? The, the application interface is great, but but the file layer still really matters as it, as it pertains to um, cybersecurity applications. And uh, as evidence of this, I will point to uh, some of the research that's been done on 802.15.4 and some really interesting exploits that have come out of this. Uh, a big one from a couple years ago is Packet and Packet, which is uh, Travis Goodspeed and some of his, uh, his neighbors there, where he was able to find that he was able to do a, um, a, a full seven layer compromise of a stack by embedding packets within other radio packets to go out over the air. Um, and uh, finally, more relevant to the, uh, the, the FI details, um, is a, uh, a, a WIDS evasion that was demonstrated by uh, my friend Ryan Spears and some other people from Dartmouth, whereby basically bending the 802.15.4 FI, that is sending frames that were not strictly compliant with the FI layer uh, definition, uh, he was able to craft packets that some receivers would hear and others would not. So if you're dealing at layer two, you're relying and you're trusting the hardware layer state machine to do things a certain way. But of course, when you're talking about designing and developing these really dense standards in silicon, people are gonna do things differently, right? So we can't take this for granted, FIs matter. We need a tool to assess them to validate that these protocols are secure and, and make them better going forward, right? So that's why we have this, uh, this out of tree module that we're releasing, we hope you enjoy it. Um, a little bit of prior art to, to cite, uh, Josh Bloom has a, uh, a LoRa SDR module for Pothos that implements a LoRa-like modulation, but gets the encoding and decoding wrong. He implemented the, um, it, it's, it's a great, great attempt, the modulation's really good, but the encoding and decoding phases he took from the documentation, which, uh, which does not agree with what's in the hardware at all. Uh, and finally, um, RPP0 on GitHub uh, has a GR LoRa that has a Python-based receiver uh, that I haven't had great, great results with. I'm gonna try to sync up with him and maybe we can put our heads together and, and combine forces and make, make this awesome. Um, uh, just quick, quick uh, discussion of the architecture here. Uh, the modulation and encoding stages and demod and decoding are modeled as separate, separate blocks for modularity. So if you don't like LoRa's, LoRa's encoding, you can write your own um, in, in plug and play. Uh, and then there's an asynchronous PDU interface between them uh, and you can write to and from it with, uh, with um, sockets. It's super easy, um, kind of inspired by how um, GR IEEE 802.15.4 does it. That's a great interface and I really like it. Um, so the demodulator and decoder implement the algorithm that we just talked about. Um, again, all the details are online if you want, want information there with the stacked FFTs. Uh, one kind of cool picture that I really like, this is the overlapped FFT um, produced by the GNU Radio out of tree module looking for the, uh, the SFD here. And you can see how as we're shifting samples through the FFT input buffer, the SFD comes into, into frame here, right? And then at the bottom you can see where the, uh, the threshold kicks and then we jump out of that state and keep going. So I thought that was just kind of a cool image to, to show off of how an internal actually working here. Uh, finally, the modulator takes a different approach. Rather than doing an FFT or an IFFT based solution, uh, I found that I was actually able to uh, pre-generate a, uh, a complex chirp lookup table and then use a phase accumulator to, uh, to basically do more direct synthesis, which is 
more computationally efficient than a uh, IFFT uh, solution would have been. Uh, so the source code, not up yet, will be up this afternoon. Um, it's going to be at that URL. Um, I'll put something up on Twitter or make an announcement when it's up there if you want to play with it. Uh, a whole bunch of things left to do. This is, you know, uh, first cut. And, uh, but, you know, here's a laundry list of things that I, I have on the agenda here. I um, want to implement the additional spreading factors and code rates for it. Currently, it only supports SF8 and code rate 4.8. Um, but, you know, it's just a matter of iterating and getting the rest built in. Uh, an important note is about the whitening sequence. Uh, I had to derive the whitening sequence over the air as part of the, um, the, the LoRa analysis process that I did for DEF CON and uh, jailbreak. Um, it's, it's really noisy. There are lots of collisions. I did a lot to iterate through it and make it better, but I'm sure there's a lot of improvement to be had there. Um, I, I'm also missing the first eight symbols worth of whitening uh, that is essential for getting the header. So I haven't reversed the header yet, but that's... Um, something that, you know, I just need the hardware to be able to, to extend that. And then finally, of course, there's a lot of iteration to be done on making this demodulator better, more accurate, you know, faster, stronger, et cetera. So just to wrap up, LP WANs uh, are proliferating. Uh, they're, they're raising a ton of money and they're starting to pop up um, all over the place. Uh, I think they're really cool. You should check them out. There are lots of standards out there, lots of fun to be had with um, taking them apart and re-implementing them. Um, and finally, as just another note, I want to call attention to the fact that obviously RF stacks are becoming more and more diverse. Um, you know, this is, this is not Wi-Fi, this is not FSK, this is not FDM, this is some cool modulation um, that was, uh, was fun to play with. So there's a lot out there, a lot of fun to be had. Um, and finally, we're adding a new tool to the researcher's arsenal, which we hope will be useful to, we hope will be useful to you as researchers and also uh, help move us forward and make um, wireless networks more secure as uh, more people get hands and, uh, and eyes on them. Uh, finally, I want to acknowledge Ballant. He was uh, super helpful with uh, doing all this. Couldn't have done it without him. Uh, and then all the open source contributors that came before me. Uh, I want to thank the conference for having me here. And I also want to take a moment to thank everybody in this room because I have leached off of your knowledge for the last several years. Um, I've learned a ton from you guys, and I'm excited to be here and hopefully give something back. Um, so thanks a lot. I'll take your questions if there's time. No, so I haven't done any, any real uh, fundamental analysis of the performance of the, uh, of, of the Lorify as implemented by the hardware. Um, I would be curious to, to see that because currently all that I've seen has been the marketing material from Semtech, um, which, uh, you know, paints a pretty rosy picture. Anecdotally, there have been some people online who've done some research and it seems like this is pretty good, um, but I don't have any first-hand experience to validate it. Um, but it, people seem to, seem to like it so far. So, do we know any open standards? I, so the, the two biggest ones, LoRa and Sigfox, are both propped up by industry interests. So LoRa, you know, I mentioned that the, the file layer is, is owned by Semtech, and they make their money on selling these ICs, right? So, you know, their differentiator there is, is having, the pro, having the IP and also having the performance. You know, something like this, you know, we view this as a research tool. This will never, you know, SDR will probably never, or at least using commodity SDR, will probably never outperform, you know, a, a a well-designed, purpose-built LoRa IC. Um, another standard that's out there is Sigfox, and Sigfox is different in the sense that not only do they own the, uh, the, the modulation, they're trying to vertically integrate the entire uh, network, provider, uh, network provider operation. So they're gonna own the technology, but they're also gonna be the ones that you're gonna buy data from. They're gonna build the network and maintain it. So there's been a lot of, uh, of interest and, and early adoption that we've seen from some of these large corporate interests. I don't know of any modulations or technologies off the top of my head. I would be very eager to talk to you um, and see if, uh, see if there was something cool that we could uh, uh, concoct here. Because I think it's a really, really cool technology. It really does come at a good time with 2G going away. 
and the whole push to you know embedded connected everything. So I think there's uh, there's probably some fun to be had there. Run over there. And I'm around today and tomorrow if you have any more questions or want to connect. So just come find me. I'm right here. So the, the question I heard was about Laura's uh, clock requirements on the, the, uh, the hardware side. Um, I don't know offhand. Um, so Laura is, so using, using my limited, my limited you know, RF and DSP knowledge here, uh, Laura's a pretty wide band modulation, which makes me think that having an accurate oscillator is probably less important than, uh, than it would be for others. Uh, Sigfox, the protocol I just mentioned that Laura competes with, is uh, a narrow, I think it's a narrow band FSK or narrow band PSK, like very narrow signal. And uh, I know a lot of the, the early kind of internet punditry that I've seen about that is they don't understand how they're able to get the performance without having a super accurate oscillator on the endpoint. Um, so I think that might be a question that could be better addressed by some of the Sigfox people in terms of what sort of oscillators are necessary for these LP-WAN standards. Um, so one other note is on the to-dos, um, there's currently no clock recovery implemented in GR LoRa. In my anecdotal exper experimenting, I haven't found that I've needed it. Um, if you're dealing with longer spreading factors or um, longer messages that have longer time on air, you might find that it's necessary. Um, of course, it's something that we can look at adding down the road if, uh, if people are interested. Okay, we will pick me at three, so we have a coffee break right now, and I'd like to ask you to give one more round of applause for all this. Thank you.